in this class because you know we'll be having even classroom discussions and so on and so forth apart from that you know you'll have to come to class on time today being the first day you know the other students are exempted so whenever they enter the class i would allow them to you know uh, i would uh, you know uh, allow them to participate in the session however next time i will not admit them in in case they are more than 15 minutes late so you could take that 15 minutes is buffering time now this is of course in your interest or rather just in case in my discretion suppose a topic is very important and i would feel that okay let the students come in but probably i will not be granting you attendance because i'll be maintaining a attendance list for myself as well Apart from the other list, what you submit to the university, you put your signature there and you send it to the, I mean, how they collect it from you, I understand. But, well, I'll be maintaining for my record as well, your attendance, because for me, uh, like, I'll be, uh, you know, even um, assessing you on the basis of class interaction and the questions that is asked to you and in the class and how you answer or in cases any, you know, uh, kind of a topic that I give you for discussion and I would just really gauge the level of understanding of your understanding of the subject um, based on what is really taught in the class. So that's about it. So first thing I've spoken about your course description, which is very important that you, I want you to go through it. Second thing is I spoke about um, your attendance, which is compulsory. And, you know, as you know, as for even your university guidelines, uh, attendance carries marks. And the third thing that I, would, I really want to tell you is about your assignments. Assignments are important as well. I would really encourage on-time assignments, on-time delivery. And of course, I have already posted the assignment, the first assignment um, in your Google Classroom. Please go ahead and just browse through that and just whatever is a topic um, it's basically a practical topic that I have given you because I don't just believe in something that is totally theoretical of course you will find theoretical information as well if you just go through your books or the textbook as well as your online material there's plenty of material available but what I'm looking forward is some kind of um, real examples that you can give me of various airports that have engaged in privatization and I don't, don't think that's going to be tough for you um, I wanted to do that because because it's, I mean, it's part of your course and it's something that will really help you for your future, being a student of the subject. Well, now let us go into the subject. Now, you very well know that we are learning about strategic aviation management. So what is your understanding about aviation management, if you can tell me? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat again one, one more time? <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, no problem. I said, what is your understanding of aviation management or, oh, yeah. Yeah, or airports yeah. and airlines management? There is no right yeah. or wrong answer in this. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, right. just tell uh, me. All right. I want to introduce myself, first of all, in order to know a lot of about me. Okay. So my name is Muhammad Abdulur, as you have seen the screen. That's uh, I am aviation field. I work international airport called Bosas International Airport. Since 2017, I was, uh, I'm, right now I am airport operation manager. Uh, I have been started the work in the field of operation 2015, but this operation field or operation manager was starting in 2017. Mm -hmm. So, I know a lot of about uh, airport, airport management, aviation right, management. You're the right person now. Tell me. So, uh, in this uh, field of aviation, uh, first of all, it's different the other sectors of, of public or private sectors because it's sensitive place. It's a very, very vulnerable uh, sector for the terrorist or for uh, the other, uh, the other terrorist uh, um, institutions. So, for airport management, is very, very, very important to run the daily activity and operations of the airport, 
as it was planned, as it was uh, as it was mentioned in, in the uh, standard operating procedures of the airport. So we have been applying and exercising the standard operating procedures that was set by the government for this airport. So we have what our main, our reference point is standard operating procedures and TOR of the airport. So as a management team, uh, we fulfill that SOB of all. That's right. So that's that's my idea. About it. Yeah, that's right. Because you've got practical experience. Can you just come yeah. again about which airport do you serve at the moment? Uh, Bosaso. Uh, one, uh, one, uh, the Bosaso airport in Somalia. Uh, the third, the third biggest airport in Somalia. Also the third busiest airport. One is for Mogadish airport. Yeah. The second is Hargis airport. The third one is Bosasa Airport. Okay. The biggest, also the biggest, we have the longest runway in Somalia. We have almost 3.2 kilometers of runway with concrete that can land. It's also sea level, can be landed by the biggest aircraft, whether some Boeing 747, whether. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have in, uh, that airport, was that international airport. That's nice. And uh, I believe runways have to be well maintained and the, long, the longer the runway, the safer it is for, uh, uh, you know, an aircraft to land. Yeah. Well, okay. So coming to the subject now, since you already know, and you've already spoken about security concerns that yeah. are, are normally, uh, which are taken care of, in an airport, right? You were talking about terrorism and that's the kind of a very vulnerable sector where you know sometimes it can be hit by terrorism and so on. So um, as part of, uh, you know, the aviation sector, you have just mentioned about security as well. So that means you already understand the importance of the aviation sector and how you know, the airport industry or even the airlines industry has progressed over the years, how it is a significant factor for trade, for commerce, as well as for families where there are families scattered abroad and they connect with each other. That means it is, uh, you know, the aviation industry, it connects the world together, right? So. Therefore, the subject that you're learning today, now it goes even for the other students, probably now you're working in the sector, Mohammed Abdinur is working in the sector, so probably there are some other students who are still not working and they're aspiring to be a part of the aviation sector. So now for those, uh, this is a little bit of introduction for them that aviation has really grown, the sector has really grown over the years. And we will see in our slides and we'll go through the history as well, how it has grown over the years. And um, uh, Abdinur has spoken about the security concerns of the sector. That means we will also delve into the aspect of legislations that are important. In, in this subject, we are also going to learn about important laws, both international as well as probably a little bit of domestic laws wherever it's applicable and we're normally going to talk in terms of international covenants and what actually contributed towards the development of the sector and, uh, and we're also going to learn about strategic aviation management we are going to learn about the hierarchy level um, you know what's the hierarchy level and what is the structure within the airport industry we're going to touch upon the aspect of privatization why you know airports across the globe have preferred uh, privatization and uh, that's a part of your assignment as well and so on so therefore, it being a significant sector, and as Abdinur spoke about it being a vulnerable sector in terms of security concerns and how, you know, security is at the highest at the airports. So thereby, we would need qualified managers to handle airports as well as airlines. It is a sensitive sector. However, 
it is a significant sector and it is it has carved a niche for itself being the most prominent and a sector where people or students normally you know they really want to be a part of that sector they aspire to be you know a part of that sector right so therefore we will move further and go through our slides and see what we have for today today it's just going to be an introductory class we're going to go through the history and we're just going to touch upon a little bit of privatization part of it so that you'll just know and we will just see how the aviation industry just progressed over the years of course now you know who invented that i'm not going to touch about the discovery part of it or the invention part of it of course but i'm sure you know who actually invented an aircraft right do you know yeah. it yeah yeah of course i know it very well So the first chapter is going to be on the story and the structure of airline industry. Now, how has this industry evolved? Of course, you know that air transport is one of the major means of transportation today. And that an airline, what is an airline? It is a company that provides air transport services with the help of an aircraft for rendering the service of transporting passengers and freight. Now, theoretically, of course, you will have to write this. Practically, you may know it, but what you know practically, some of you, like Abdinu, you are working there. So what you know practically, you will have to word it. Now, the aviation industry began to develop after the First World War in 1918. That means it, you know, began developing way back in 1918. And for the first time, you know, it really started burgeoning in 1918. So it began evolving since then and predominantly gained momentum, that is kind of a speed, after the Second World War in 1945. Then it began the rapid e expansion of international routes. So the sort of connectivity began there. So the earliest airlines was actually introduced in Europe and that was in Germany, that is a German airship company called D-E-L-A-G, founded on 16th November 1909. However, the world's first scheduled passenger airline service took off in USA way back in 1914 from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa, Florida. And this actually paved the way for today's transcontinental flight. So this is a little bit of history and we'll go for forward with that. So in 1919, the Netherlands organized a new airline called as KLM and KLM till today is the world's oldest continuously operating airlines. And towards the end of the 19th century, European labs set the leap in theoretical aeronautical research. And there was this NASA, not the NASA one, I'm talking about NACA, that is the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which was established in 1915, which evolved as one of the world's leading aeronautical centers. Now, what was the role of the center? The role of the center was basically to give, you know, to provide recommendations, and it, it, it really operated as a specialized organization to investigate accidents, to study certain cases, or study the cause of accidents, and provide recommendations that would really lay up precedent that would play a key role in the safety of air travel and so that such kind of incidents would not occur again. So in the 1960s later on it witnessed the development of jet liners with the introduction of turbofan engine and introduction of wide body 400 seat Boeing 747 in 1969 and that's what Abdinur was talking about about the runway in the airport that he's serving and he said it's kind of you know it's viable enough even for a Boeing uh, jet craft or you know to really you know land in the airport that where he's working where he said that you know the runway is quite smooth and you know with tar and so on well so it is the 1960s that witnessed the development of jet liners with the introduction of turbofan engine and the introduction of wide bodied 400 seat boeing 747 in towards the end of 1960s that is in 1969 now, the first convention in aviation was the Paris Convention of 1919, which addressed the regulation of air commerce, 
the sovereignty of airspace and each nation had, you know, ha has to observe uh, or it has absolute sovereignty over its airspace. So it was in this Paris Convention that they addressed this issue of sovereignty of airspace. That means the airspace belongs to the nation. The airspace over the territory of a particular nation, it belongs to a particular nation. So of course, I believe that you know that as well, that is the sovereignty of airspace. So that is where now again, laws come into the picture. There is international, there, is, there should be no trespass of airspace. Without the permission of the other country, one cannot really you know, enter the airspace of another country. That's within the ambit of international laws. So the convention that is the Paris Convention led to airspace regulation. So this was the first convention, which where they came up with this idea talking about airspace. And they said that airspace should be regulated as well, airspace over the territories. And they said that, you know, it has to be regulated. And this particular convention laid the foundation for aviation laws, both in domestic as well as international sphere to regulate flights using the airspace of any nations. That means nations have the right to either permit or reject entry into their airspace. In this particular convention, there was actually 11 countries that participated and ratified. That means they signed this convention or they, they agreed to participate in this convention or go by the, the whatever agreement is made within this convention. So they said they ratified it. That is only 11 countries, but there were some other countries which not agreed to this convention. And one of it was, of course, the United States of America. Then a decade later, that is after 10 years in 1929, that is after 1919, then 1929, there was a convention for unification of certain rules relating to international transportation by air, which is also referred to as a Warsaw Convention. So this is a very important convention, which is prevalent till today. Day, of course, the, the amended form of it, where it was amended in 1955 at The Hague and then in 1975 in Montreal. So this Warsaw Convention basically covenanted on regulating the liability of international carriage of persons, luggage or goods carried by aircraft and repeating. So this convention basically, basically dealt with international carriage of people or persons along with their baggages or you call it luggages or even goods in case it is you know uh, uh, you know a cargo flight so it dealt with Warsaw Convention spoke about the protection and safety or in terms of regulating the liability of the airline in terms of a person's luggage or goods or also the people who are in the aircraft so the chief result of this convention or the chief purpose of this convention was to achieve uniformity of rules governing claims from international airport transportation. Now, Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention states that, now this is a law, and when there is a law, you'll have to just give the law as it is in inverted commerce. In case you do not remember it, you just give a simple statement, but no inverted commerce. Now, the Warsaw Convention in uh, Article 17, it states that the carrier shall be liable for damage sustained in the event of the death or wounding of a passenger or any other bodily injury suffered by a passenger if the accident which caused the damage so sustained took place on both the aircraft or in the course of any of the operations of embarking or disembarking. What does it mean? Now, under Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention, any carrier or any aircraft or carrier, you know, the airline, shall be made liable for any damage that any of the passenger has sustained while the passenger or the luggage of the passenger has been or the, the passenger has been on board the aircraft or even while the passenger has been embarking or disembarking. So before 1996, smoking was permitted in flight. Well, this was something, this is quite interesting for us to know, it, 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 whereas now it is certainly not permitted. But in 1996, before 1996, smoking was permitted in flight. 
and the aircraft was divided those days into smoking and non-smoking area. However, in 1996, the International Civil Aviation sought an outright ban on smoking. Now, a classic case is a US case related to Olympic Airways Flight 417. Uh, this is going to really substantiate the point of Article 17, and you're going to really get an insight into how Article 17 really works. In this case, in Olympic Airways versus Hussein, and that is a citation. Now, when you're mentioning case laws, you will have to mention the entire citation. And what's the citation here? Olympic Airways versus Hussein, comma 540 US 644. 2004. That means the case, it was decided in 2004. Now, in this case, of course, there was a person called Dr. Uh, Dr. Abid Hansen, and he was a passenger on Olympic Airways Flight 417 from Cairo, Egypt, via Athens, Greece, to New York City in the U.S., so Hansen died following an exposure to secondhand smoke. Now, what happened here was Dr. Hansen was traveling in this aircraft on this, uh, you know, in this Olympic Airways. And he had actually a history of, uh, you know, recurrent anaphylactic reactions and yet sensitivity to secondhand smoke. That means in the sense, even if somebody else is smoking, even if, it, you know, uh, he's a passive smoker, I mean, it would really affect him. He, he was allergic to smoke. So, and he had a history. So he, so therefore he insisted on, you know, on a seat that is far away from the smoking section and he insisted on that. However, he was allotted a seat which was close to the smoking section or rather in the smoking section. And even his wife insisted and she requested a non-smoking seat. When the family boarded the Boeing 747 aircraft in Athens, the family found that the assigned seats were three rows ahead of economy smoking class area. And there was no partition between smoking and non-smoking sections in that particular aircraft. So the family repeatedly requested a seat farther away from the smoking section by the flight attendant, Maria, she would not move the passenger to any of the 11 other unoccupied seats on the aircraft. So there were unoccupied seats in the aircraft. It was available in the non-smoking smoking section, but this flight attendant, you know, did not move the passenger to any other seat. So Dr. Hansen, he was allergic, of course, and he had the, you know, a history of being allergic to smoke. So Dr. Hansen felt a reaction to the smoke and died several hours later, despite his doctor's aid. So the question before the court was whether a pre-existing medical condition aggravated by airplane conditions can be considered an accident under the Warsaw Convention's Article 17, holding the airline responsible for the damages. So that was a question whether they could hold the airline you know, responsible for the damages. So a three judge bench of the United States Court of Appeals unanimously affirmed that Maria's actions not only met the definition of accident under Article 17 of Warsaw Convention, but also rose to the level of being willful misconduct. What is willful misconduct is where you know the consequences of your action and you're bound by your duty to perform in a reasonably normal manner, but you did not do it, that would amount to willful misconduct on duty. So therefore, the flight attendant's conduct was considered as willful misconduct. She very well knew the consequence. She was requested, but though there was a seat available, she did not you know, move the passenger for whatsoever reason that's known to her. And then the Court of uh, you know, Appeals in the United States, they, uh, you know, they studied the matter and came to a conclusion that it does come within the ambit of accident, the definition of accident as explained in, or as laid down in Article 17 of the Warsaw, Warsaw Convention. And the flight attendants, you know, misconduct of course, could be construed as willful misconduct as defined under Article 25 of the Warsaw Convention. 
Apart from that, what the court did was it removed a 75,000 cap on damages, $75,000 cap on damages, and went ahead and awarded 700,000 US dollars as compensatory damages to the family against Olympic Airways and held that here, the act that was actually committed constitutes an accident and could be construed as coming within the ambit of Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention. Before we move further, just in case we get disconnected, please join back. Next is, as per the Warsaw Convention, airlines are liable to pay damages caused to the passengers in terms of death or bodily injury during embarking, disembarking, or onboard carriage. So the carrier may escape liability. So what could be the reason that the carrier can escape liability? The carrier can escape liability if all possible precautions have been taken under reasonable circumstances, reasonable precautions should have been taken to avoid the injury or the plight of passengers on board. So protection from not only the person is you know, extended here, but also for goods or luggages of passengers is assured by this particular regulation. Yet another interesting case is about Eastern Airlines Incorporation versus Floyd 499 US 530 1991. Here, a flight was directed by Eastern Airlines from Miami to Bahamas, experienced engine failure. Now, the in flight aircraft team let the passengers know that the plane would need an emergency landing in the sea. After a time of quick drop, the team had the option to recover control of the plane and landed securely. So they did not have to you know, land on the sea, but everything went off well and they, were, they managed to land securely. So the passengers were actually not really harmed. So Floyd and other passengers, now what they did was they sued Eastern Airlines for mental misery under Article 17 of the Warsaw Convention. They said that, you know, it has caused certainly some harm to us, but it has caused mental harm to us. Probably there has not been any physical harm, but you know you could extend mental mental misery to be you know come to come under the definition of an accident or to come within the definition of physical harm caused by an accident as a result of the negligence of airlines and so on. So the court held here that Article 17 of Warsaw Convention does not allow recovery for mental injuries. And this is a recent case in 1991. So they did not extend the definition to mental injuries. The next is the structure of airline industry. And this is just the introduction again. Traditionally, airlines are owned by the public sector. You know that government, public sector. But today, most airlines have transitioned towards privatization. For example, we have even this Mumbai airport, for example, in India, they have transitioned towards partly privatization. There are certain airlines in India, for example, they have move towards privatization and so on. For example, Air India and so on. Air India was once upon a time, you know, part of, uh, you know, it was the official flight of India. It was, of course, a part of public sector. It was a government run airline, but now, now it is, of course, totally privatized. So privatization models are divided into five types. There are five types of privatization models. In what way can an airline industry be privatized or how can even an airport be privatized? The first model is share flotation. We'll go into through the detail uh, like in the next slide. The first form is, of course, share flotation, if you have heard of this. Next is trade sale. Third is concession. Fourth is project finance or BOT, B-O-T, B-O-T abbreviated build, operate, transfer. And the fifth form is, of course, the simplest form is management contract. In 2012, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, published a manual on privatization for the first time to help with the privatization decisions and processes. So you could call it as ICAO 2012 or 2012. So privatization involves a complex decision-making process. I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me. I mean, everybody knows that privatization is not, you know, an easy task. It is a complex decision-making process. And of course, it is a Herculean, you know, it involves Herculean legal procedures. So now here, 
talking about decision part of it. It involves series of complex decisions that needs to be taken with a structured goal to be achieved. Now, they know what they want. They have a structured goal. And so they know that they have to reach or, you know, obtain that particular goal. It's a structured goal. It's a planned goal to be achieved. There is always a reason for privatization. It's not that just they feel that, well, I think we should be privatized. It's not that. There are financial concerns. Probably there are certain losses that the you know, airline has incurred or even the airport has incurred. Oh, they want some development. They feel that they're not having enough funds to develop the airport or even airlines. So therefore, there are certain decisions that need to be taken to achieve a structured goal. So one important decision that really would help them in you know, concretizing the business or even putting an airline or even the airport industry to the next level is by privatization. Now, privatization is an important decision. Now, for achieving the particular goals, now, one of the goals, of course, as I said earlier, let me reiterate, that would be reducing the financial burden on the public sector. For example, the government is not able to bear, uh, you know, the, the burden, the financial burden in maybe maintaining or upgrading the airport or even the airlines. Or, you know, they need some ownership to be shared. They want their shares to be shared. So they would, uh, so that they would build efficiency, maintain healthy competition, it would help them in generating funds, increase management expertise, or see, these are some of the goals and build better structure, industrial growth, and so on as some of the reasons that may be considered as a goal of privatization of airlines or even airports. So factors such as the extent of control that the government wishes to maintain in or partially it wants to maintain in the privatization process, that will have to be gauged. That will have to be actually assessed here. That is, also, it could be a public-private partnership. That is, you know, they could have 50 50 percent a kind of management can be done by someone else and the ownership could be with, uh, with someone else. So it depends what kind of an agreement, what kind of privatization, or under which model, uh, they, which model they have chosen for privatization, the models that we have just enumerated about. So now let's go in detail about each type of model, of course, detail in the sense, of course, briefly, but just to tell you what is, what does each type of model really imply? Now, share flotation, this is, I mean, simple as the name suggests, suggests share flotation. If you've studied in commerce, if you have studied in your, you know, your first degree, you must have learned about share flotation. So share flotation is something but it offers its shares to the public, its initial public offering, IPO, what we call it. And where in the airports, company share capital is issued and subsequently traded on the stock market. So the first priority here will be normally given to the current management of the company to acquire shares. Then the government owner, on the other hand, will give up total or partial ownership and transfer the existing economic risks and operative control to the new shareholder. So this is basically the form of issuing of public offering or you know, IPOs. The next form of privatization is of course a trade sale. So under this option, uh, through the vehicle of a public tender, some portion of the airport or at times even the entire airport may be sold to a trade partner. Before we get disconnected, a gentle reminder, in case we get disconnected, please join back. Attendance would be awarded only after the end of the lecture. I mean, once the lecture gets uh, completed, it's only then that the attendance will be noted down. Well, so under this option of trade sale, through the vehicle of a public tender, some portion of the airport or at times even the entire airport may be sold to a trade partner or a consortium of investors. Now, who are this consortium? You know, this consortium normally comprises of all certain specialists in the field of aviation and industry, or it could be people from the engineering field, legal background. So there are certain specialists who they form a consortium. And this consortium, they would say that, yes, we want to invest in the sector. So what they would do 